Hello and welcome everyone to our webinar. Today's topic will be Create Small Fine Lettering. This webinar is designed to show you how to deal with small embroidery text and give recommendations. Special attention is needed whenever your text height is shorter than 5 millimeters or if your, if your setting columns become so narrow that uh, they are between uh, 1 and 1.2 millimeters. That's when you really need to be careful and apply many of the things that we are going to learn today. The challenge. Needle size, thread size and machine speed. Digitizing, special rules will apply and we will give you suggestions. And at the end I will be doing two examples that will reflect uh, and show many of the, of the rules and suggestions that we will be learning during today's session. Needles. Needle manufacturers, they offer their needles in different sizes. And not only sizes, also with uh, different points, for example, sharp points or, or round points. So we will be focusing on needles with uh, the diameter, the blade size, basically. The most commonly used needle with embroidery or multi-head embroidery manufacturers is needle number 11-75. That's what you see here. I'll try to spotlight it here on the, on the chart on the left hand side. You see here that's 0 0.75 that is equivalent to needle number 11 with the number metric 75. So what that means is 0.75, that's the diameter of the blade. If you look at the picture here on top, this part of the needle, that's called the blade, and the diameter here is 0.75 millimeters every time you're using a needle 11-75. So if you're working with very small text, very narrow columns, it is definitely very helpful to use a smaller needle. In this case, we would recommend you to use needle size 8 or needle size 9. Needle size 8 would be a diameter of 0 0.60 millimeters. Thread. Thread also comes in various sizes. So you usually you will have a choice of polyester thread or rayon thread. In any case, those threads are actually they consist of two threads. And let me show you here on the picture the picture you see here on the right hand side, which is uh, Right. Spotlight. Okay, so here you see here it consists of two thread lines, one on the left, one on the right, and those these two threads are being twisted together and that will result in one, let's say a thicker thread, which is uh, called two ply. So usually thread manufacturers they will offer their threads in either size forty which is the most commonly used thread in, uh, with embroidery uh, manufacturers. But those thread manufacturers also uh, offer thread sizes in number 60, for example, which is a, a thinner thread. And that thread, again, would definitely help if you are aiming for very good quality, very nice and clear look in your text, in your small text, then we definitely recommend you to use 
thread size number 60. And just for the records, the thread sizes are being, or the measurements are, you have a couple of names out there. For example, you may hear about Dittertex or Denier. These are uh, very technical terms. So let's stick with uh, the numbers. Thread manufacturers offering their th embroidery thread in number. Number 40 is the usually used thread for embroiderers. And the alternative, if you use uh, thinner thread, want to use a thinner thread, then use the number 60 thread. Machine speed. Machine speed is definitely also a factor. You can see here on the image on the left hand side that if you're doing a zigzag, a column stitch or a satin stitch, the frame movement is, is uh, moving very, very quickly to the left, to the right, up and down, depending on uh, your stitch angles. So if you're running your machine at uh, very high speed, let's say 1,000 stitches per minute, that causes vibrations. And uh, those vibrations, they, they will influence definitely the, uh, for example, the fabric that is hooked into your frame. So if, if the movements are very fast, the vibrations are higher. We recommend you to slow down the speed whenever you are embroidering on a smaller parts, smaller columns like text, that will also help improving your quality. Digitizing. So we need to be aware of a couple of things when we are digitizing small narrow column, columns. One of the things we have to consider is the satin stitch width. The smallest satin stitch width that I think you should never go below that is one millimeter. So keep in mind, if you see here the picture on the left hand side, we have a column width of one millimeter. That's the absolute limit. Don't go below that. Try to digitize your columns with one millimeter. Usually the I find the best width that uh, where, where text comes out really nice, that's when you use columns of 1.1 millimeters. So there is, a, there is a something that we have to be aware, and I'm trying to reflect that here on the image on the right hand side, that's the needle diameter. So if you are using a, a needle number 70, then the circles here on the on this picture are reflecting the diameter. So of course, when the needle penetrates into the fabric, it will punch a little hole in there. If the diameter is uh, 70, 0 0.70 or 0 0.75 uh, millimeters, that hole theoretically is 0 0.75 millimeters in diameter. So if your column is too narrow, the next needle penetration, the next perforation will be here and if they are too close together then the worst case is if they overlap, all right? So that will create even a bigger hole. That's why, that's why you have to keep in mind to keep your columns at least at one millimeter in width, in a satin stitch width. On the cir circles here on the right hand side of the image, we try to simulate a diameter in case we use a needle size 60, which means 0 0.6 millimeters in diameter. So we are giving more space. We're giving a chance for the needles to be separated a little bit more, and that, of course, will help. That's why we suggest when you really go for quality and you want to get good results, use a smaller needle. Satin stitch densities. Well, a density, 
a certain stitch density is the distance between one stitch to the next one. That's what you see here on this image. And again, if we take our the theory, the needle penetrating into, into the fabric, producing a little hole, and you have a very tight density, which is what, what we reflect here on this image, then the, the needles from one stitch to the next one will overlap the penetrations, perforations, and potentially creating a big mess, a big hole in there. I'm saying big hole because uh, what you see here in the image, of course, is, is a large, uh, large uh, zoom, and definitely this will this will create problems. So when we talk about stitch de certain stitch densities, don't make or don't use too tight densities. On the, the image on the right hand side, you see a simulation of an adequate stitch density where you give enough space between perforation of one stitch line to the next one. Our suggestions for satin stitch densities, because you will ask me, yes, what, what is the correct satin stitch density to use for, for narrow satin stitch widths? Well, basically, if, if your satin column, the satin stitch width is between 1 millimeter and 1.2 millimeters, then I suggest you to use a stitch density of 0 0.45 millimeters. Usually that, that will do the trick. That's a good value. If your satin stitch widths are between 1.2 millimeters and 2 millimeters, then I suggest you to use a density of 0 0.40 millimeters. All right, so, well, I would say if, if it's between 1.2 millimeters to 1.5, probably you should be using 0 0.43, and if it's coming closer to the 2 millimeter range, then use a density of 0 0.40 millimeters. Underlay. That's very important. Underlay, with an underlay, basically you create a base a base, something where the satin stitches can hold at. So, on the image on the left hand side, you see a single layer center run stitch. That's what we recommend if you're doing satin stitch widths between 1 millimeters and 1.5 millimeters, that would be good to use a single layer center run stitch. Of course, that stitch line should be exactly in the center of your column and whenever possible it should be a single layer, mean, meaning there should be one, only one line of such underlay stitches. Inevitably you will have sometimes situations where you have two lines and that's because it always depends where you connect, connect one letter to the next one, you will have to travel. All right. So, usually we separate this. You have traveling stitches and you have the real underlay stitches. So, the worst case scenario is that you have two layers of stitches, as seen here on this part of the small lowercase letter M. If you're dealing with the satin stitch widths of over 1.5 millimeters, then it's nice and according to our experience to use a double zigzag underlay as seen here on the, on the right image. The, when you use a double, a double zigzag underlay stitch then you should uh, go a little bit uh, higher with your stitch density so something between 0 0.45 and 0 0.50 millimeters will do the trick. Okay, so if you're using satin stitch widths of over 1.5 millimeters and especially if you're embroidering on, on elastic fabrics, then a double zigzag underlay is very helpful. And keep in mind to, to open up a little bit your density. 
alignment and grid lines. When you're digitizing, it's very wise to place alignment grid lines on the top and on the bottom baseline of your text. On this image here you see I, we tried to simulate a, a text line of uh, text which is below, below 6 millimeters in height. And the grid lines will help you to align letters that have straight endings like the N, you can see that here, and round letters like the letter O, but also letters that have uh, horizontal columns where the stitch angle is 90 degree, like here, this part of the letter R, and this part of the letter T. So what you would do is, for round letters, you will align the upper part of the upper limit of the uh, outline of the O and then the bottom, the bottom line of the O exactly on the outer sides of the grid line. And you would do the same here with the top part of the R and the top part of the T. The grid line's height for letters smaller than, uh, than 6 millimeters should be 0 0.2 millimeters. Okay, so that's the distance here. And we will see when I, I'll do, I'm doing the example, digitizing example, how you can create those grid lines. Compensation for satin columns. If you look at the, at the screenshot, the scanned image here on top, you will have sometimes the, the uh, result that letters don't seem to align very well. We call it uh, letters dancing, all right? So that's what we try to show here in this screenshot. And you can see it here, the C looks smaller than the H, and so on. Now, the reason for this happening is because you will have pushing and pulling going on on your satin stitch columns. On the center image here you can see where the pulling is happening. Everywhere where you see the red arrows you have pulling going on, which means that the stitches are actually being shrinked because of the tension of the thread. So in these areas here, the, the columns tend to shrink. And at the other hand, at the open ends of the letters, like here in this part, and here in this part of the letter set, the st stitches are pushing. So basically, one stitch is pushing the next one ever so slightly further out. All right? That's what we call pulling and pushing. In order to compensate for this pulling and pushing that is going on, we can apply pull and push compensation. So there is an automatic uh, uh, feature in, uh, in the properties of satin segments in the pulse system where you can make stitches to over, over stitch a little bit over your outline segments. Like what you see here on the right hand image, the dotted, dot, dotted uh, red circles or ovals are showing you that the stitches are basically extending uh, beyond the outline. All right, so we are we are adding a pull compensation to compensate for the shrink shrinkage. And at the other hand, at the openings of the letters, we are applying a push compensation, which means that basically the stitch, the last stitch is like being chopped off and you can dictate uh, how much of this chopping is going on. Alright, so you see here the stitch is ending quite a little bit. I mean, don't forget we are, we are looking here at an image at a uh, very large zoom size, a little bit further inside and the same here at this end.
compensation of narrow inside areas. Well, you will have, especially if you are dealing with the lowercase letters, like uh, letter O, lowercase letter E, lowercase letter A, you will have areas, gaps inside. inside. So if you are applying pull compensation, you're in danger of making those gaps even smaller. And you, you want to try to avoid that. So what you would do is, you would digitize the inside outline a little bit, a little further uh, uh, away from the center, in order to give more room to, to the gap here. That's what you see here on the image on the bottom side, the, the red outline. As a result, you will gain more space here and you avoid the over overcrowding of stitches here, making this gap basically disappear. A good value to, to keep in mind is the space should be between 0 0.8 and 1 millimeters. If you have that, then your chances are very, very good that this gap will actually be visible when you embroider your letters. On this slide, you see what I was mentioning before, your, the cramping of, of stitches in very small open gaps, like what you see here on the letter E and on the letter A, basically you will, you will, this will be like a knot of stitches here when you embroider this out. So again, what you need to do is to increase the inside space and you will have, as a result, a recognizable lower, lowercase letter E that this example shows. There is also one thing that you need to consider, and that's, that are the tail ends of letters like a lowercase letter E. If you look at this image here, you see this tail end, the outline, it's very close towards the horizontal bar of the letter E. If you would embroider this, then you would have this result as showing here on this strike, strike out uh, image. All right, so this space here becomes so close that the, the letter E will basically appear like a, a closed a letter O. All right, so what you need to do is you need to chop off the tail end of the E, push this a little bit further down so that you gain space between this end and the horizontal bar. And the result when you embroider this is a recognizable letter, lowercase letter E. Letter spacing. You will you will face a, a situation where when you are doing very, very small letter sizes that um, you are you're making your space even smaller if you place one letter next to the next to the other at a very short distance so keep in mind it should be it should be optically nice to see a, a little distance between one letter to the other Usually, it depends if you have straight letters following a straight letter, then you will need a little bit more space in between, like this example here between the letter N and the letter I. If you have a round letter followed by a straight letter, then distance can be normal. And then you have a situation where you have a round letter followed by another round letter where you would be able to to bring those letters even closer together. So it should be appealing to the eye when you when you read your embroidered text. Digitize corners as individual overlapped segments. I like to suggest this method here of creating corners. Whenever you have a short corner like on letters R as this example shows, or letters E, P, everywhere where you have a sharp corner, in order to 
really make that corner look sharp when it's embroidered, it's a good recommendation to split up your columns, like what you see here. You see the vertical column is basically maintaining a stitch angle. So here the stitch angle is ever so slightly inclinated, but it's not doing a full turn here. And when you look at the horizontal bar here, we have the same situation. So the stitch angle here is slightly angled, but not really doing a sharp turn here. So we are avoiding a sharp turn. And by doing so, and you see here also the, I'm, I'm overlapping one column into the other, all right? And here this, this little gap here is, is really small. Again, we're looking at an image at a, a very large zoom. So that will, that will make sure that this part here, that will be the, the corner here. So the stitch result will look like that. This is a very good re recommendation if you want to, to make sure that your corners look spiky. An additional thing you, you can uh, do in order for not only corners but also the, the beginning and the ends of, uh, of columns to make them look sharp is to extend the, uh, the last stitches, or in this corner, for example, to, to extend the stitch ever so slightly to the outside. So that this becomes longer than compared to this line of stitches and this line of stitches. When I say ever so slightly, I mean by a very a marginal figure, like 0 0.1 millimeters, if you're doing very small text. And this image here on the right-hand side shows you the same thing for the the ends, the beginning and the end of columns. So just extend the up, upper side and, and the bottom side ever so slightly. That will make uh, that sh look sharp. This is also a good recommendation when you are embroidering on thick and elastic fabrics. Avoid turning stitch angles in extremely small satin text. This image shows you what we mean by that. You see this letter S, usually what you would do is you would digitize it in a way that the stitches will turn into the next column like that. So if you are dealing with very small letter sizes like this example, uh, 3.8 millimeter letter height, just imagine, imagine 3.8 millimeters, how small is that? All right. So. The best way how to deal with this is to make sure that stitch angles in columns, and you split the columns like this part is one column, one segment, and this part is one segment. So you maintain in both columns the same stitch angle. In the letter S, stitches will end up looking like this, and in letter C, stitches will end up looking like that. And here, on the scanned image of the embroiders, embroidered sample, you see how sharp the S becomes actually recognizable. If you would turn the stitches, you would not get this result here. And the same with the letter C. Very nice result here. All right, this is a very important uh, aspect of doing extremely small text sizes. Digitize serifs in the same stitch angle as the column stitch. So more or less it's the same concept as uh, the earlier slide. If you have uh, fonts or letters that have serifs, don't try to force change the, sh the stitch angle here to a 90 degree stitch angle. That makes no sense. You have way too little space there to do that. All right. And again, remember the minimum satin width that we recommend you to do is one millimeter. So if you would do that here in one millimeter, you would basically chop off the good part of the letter U. And at the end of the day, it doesn't look good. All right? So keep, keep the stitch angle the same as in the column stitches. If you are going below the, the doable in letter height, 
then it makes no sense to try to force doing letters in satin stitch. That's when you have to do letters in running stitch, like this example shows. We have here a screenshot of a text height of, it's smaller than 3.8 millimeters. So we have decided to digitize this in a run stitch or in a manual stitch. And that's how you can get as a result a recognizable text. Especially if you have a dark thread on, on a light fabric, so the contrast is, is good, you will be able to see this very well. Digitize letters, uh, small sized register trademarks in run stitch. Well, the same concept like before, if you have a very small area like this trademark R, makes no sense to do that in satin stitch. You will end up with uh, a bunch of stitches and you will not recognize anything. So do that in running stitches. Soft fabrics. Digitize small sized satin text on a complex fill block background. That's what this image shows you here. You see the green text, the green satin text is sitting on a bed of complex fill. The complex fill helps give, give stabilization. So imagine you have a soft fabric or something very stretchy. Uh, you will have a lot of problems if you would try to embroider your small text straight on that fabric. Our recommendation is to place a complex fill background with a, with a soft open density, for example 0 0.50 or a little bit higher, and do that in, to in a tone to tone in tone color. All right. So if your fabric is, for example, like this cream, then try to use a cream thread for that complex fill. That will give good support to your text. Use capital letters for small text heights. This image shows you an extremely small text. It's, it's embroidered on a twill. That's why we were even able to, to create text which is readable in a, a text height of 3.3 .3 millimeters. This is a big zoom here, so this uh, embroidery really was very small. And you see here that we, we are using all capital letters. It would make no sense to try to force your lowercase letters because you, are, you have way too little space and you're cramping uh, too many stitches in, in small areas. Just imagine a letter, lowercase letter A or a letter E. So the best choice is, as seen here, use uppercase letters. And also one thing you see here, if you have uh, letters E, you, you would like to do the horizontal bar as just one stitch out and one stitch in. All right, so we are ready to go for the, for the exercise. Let me prepare the GML. And I will switch the application here to DGML. I hope you can see the user interface here. All right. Let's make an example here with this scanned image, which is in the background. Very low quality. I'll make a big zoom and you can see how crappy this is. So very pixelated very difficult, if not impossible, to get good results if you try to attempt to digitize this based on your back, backdrop image. What I recommend you to do is try to work with two type fonts which will, uh, will serve you as a guideline. So the hardest thing actually is to find a matching 
true type font to whatever your logo text uh, shows. I have done uh, this in advance, so I found out that the true t matching true type font here is Arial Narrow. So I'm going to use my text tool and I'm going to change the font type to true type fonts. True type, true type fonts, as I mentioned, Arial Narrow, so let's try to find it. Arial Narrow is, is right here. All right. Well, before I do that, of course, I should measure how how tall can I go with the letters. So let's try to find this out by making a huge zoom here. Letter T. I'm going to measure it with my measurement tool. So we are talking about a letter height of 4.4 4. 4 millimeters. All right. So now that I have more or less the height available, I'll go here, text, real narrow, and I'll choose. Actually, I will go with the height smaller because we are going to, you are going to see, I'm going to use the offset tool, and that's going to increase the size of my letters a little bit. So let's start with the four points, yeah, let's say 4.0 millimeters, and I will enter my text. Let me, let me try to show you just a little section of it. We don't, we don't have too much time here, so I cannot punch the whole letter, so let's just do the southern. Southern, which is all, no, it's not all uppercase, it's upper and lowercase. Southern, all right. So place it here. There we are. As a result, I'll make a big zoom here. Press the uh, number four key on my keyboard to to fit my selection on the screen. You see here that my true type font was converted into a complex field. That's not what I want. So what I can do here, I go into the segment properties, text fill and border and change the complex field which is there as default into an artwork. That's what I want. I apply it and you see that's the result. Next thing I do is I'll place text approximately where my scanned image is and like that and then I'll try to accommodate the the letters into their respect, respective position. And you see I'm using the shift key actually which will move one letter and every letter after that one as well. So we are here. This one T looks okay. The E needs to go a little bit further. Well, see I'm having here a problem because I didn't make the line long enough. Maybe I should do that. Extend this line a little bit. And again, let's try to move the E now. Okay, it's not going well. Okay, let's keep it like that. Next thing I do is I select my text and I will convert this. Press the equal key on the keyboard. I convert text into segments. As a result, I have individual letters, as you can see, S, O, each one of my letters are individual artwork segments now. Next thing I do is I'll zoom in. I will zoom in here real big, real large, and let's measure the the size. Actually, the width, my column widths right now are way, way too thin. You see, 0 0.3 millimeters. That's not a good embroidery size. It's impossible to do this in satin. So what I will do is I will use a tool which I'm not sure whether you're familiar with it. It's called the offset tool. And you can see the shortcut is Shift O. All right. So before I do this, I before I use this tool, I will create oh, what did I do here? I will create with a circle tool, drawing tool, a guideline because I want to achieve columns that have at least one millimeter uh, column width. 
So one millimeter by one millimeter. There I have my little guideline. Let me turn this into this pink here. And I will position, and you see here, I'll position it right there in the center. Next thing I do is I select my S, the artwork, and now with Shift O, I access the offset tool. And I'll switch off the copy offset say OK, and now I'm going to push my outlines of the S to the outside. And you see here now, I got as a result a one millimeter column there. So there is, by doing that, you create a couple of additional nodes here. You see these little dots? Our nodes. There is one function you can use here, which is called reduce nodes. Let's see what the result is. If we don't like it, we can still switch it off. But you see here, it reduced the whole segment to fewer nodes. And if you're really very picky, you can go and say large zoom here, and say no, this this one should be a little bit rounder, like that, like that. And you remember that we mentioned that this column should be not too close with this one here first. So we, what we will do is we will just, we can do two things, we can move this column or this end and this end further up there. You need to be careful to not destroy the shape. So let me create an anchor point here and now I can move this one further up. Perfect. Okay, this one ever so slightly over there. Good. So next one here, maybe this one. Nicer curve, curvature. So let's do the same with this end here. We will create a node here at an anchor point and maybe we do the same here at an anchor point. And now I'll move this one further down this one further down and maintain a nice shape there. Okay, you can delete this one here. Oops, do the opposite. Need to delete this. Okay, now we can place it a little bit further down. Good. So I'm happy. So let's do the same thing with the letter O. The letter O, you see, actually you have two outlines. So in order to be able to use the offset tool, we need to break this apart. So I'm going to use the control K. I end up with two segments. Let's uh, zoom in on this one. And we also need my little guideline circle here. Place this right there. Take the outside shape. Shift O to access my offset tools and again I will slide the outside further outside and maybe we can reduce the notes here. Yes, satisfy with the result. Do the same here. Shift O and do the same here to the inside. Okay, so here we need to be careful that we don't end up clogging up this empty sp this space here. All right, so with the O, actually, I would like to control Z to make this, to give a little bit more space here inside. Shift O. Right there. Okay. Perfect. I like that. So I'm doing this with all the letters. Next step is to create the, the grid line. The grid line is best done with using the rectangle tool and then you right click so you can give in your parameters. 
we will want to have, uh, let's say, a 40 millimeter in, uh, in the x direction and 0 0.2 in the height. All right, there we have our little grid line and we will move it right, right there. Let me also change the color so we can better see that. Green, all right. So I will duplicate that and I'll position also one here at the bottom. I'll zoom in real big and this is perfect you see the outer part of the letter S is resting on the outer part of the grid line and on, on the top we need to place this a bit further down like, like that alright so we are ready to go for digitizing you have you have two options now you can use your artwork seg segment and let's hide what we see in the background, you see here how clean and smooth and uh, and perfect my letters are for digitizing now. So you can use that as a guideline and digitize with your satin tool and run stitch tool, or you could use your your conversion tools. For ex I, I will use I will make an example here. We're converting the letter S. I will convert that into a satin. So press D on the keyboard press an angle line here, or place an angle line there, and then I keep on going with the angle lines like that. All right. And we generate the stitches. So we'll have to think now with our embroidery minds. This letter S is going to it's, it's, first of all, it's the start of my embroidery, so I will need to have some lock stitches somewhere and I will also need to place my underlays. And I need to consider where the connection to the next letter is, which would be here in this area. So what I, what I would like to do is, I'm going to slice, so using my slice tool, I'm going to slice the letter S right there. Okay, so what that does is we have separated my letter S in two parts, the bottom part and the top part. So now we need to work on that. Top part, I would like to have the start point here and the exit point there. And generate. And the top part, I would like to have the start point right here and the exit point where it is. Next thing is I will accommodate the underlays, the lock stitches and the underlays. So we will insert with a running stitch and here's a running stitch and uh, you see my running running stitch values are three millimeters, that's okay. So let's let's place some one, two, three, four five little stitches, then I'll go up here and I'll finish this off and I place my run stitch right in front here. So I have my lock stitches done manually and then I walked over here so I have a single run on the lay there. And then I have my satin, you see it starts here, ends there and here on my sequence view you can see the, the next part is the top part of the letter S and here I also can use uh, my insert uh, key. So I, I select my segment S and I want to insert something before that selection. So I press insert key on the keyboard and then I press and I work with my run stitch. So right now we are, we are here. I will walk and place my underlay stitches nicely over there. All right, and once I'm done, I press the insert key again, and you see this segment has been placed now in between those two. So as a result, I'll do Shift X, so you see just the stitches that what we have here. It will start with some line lock stitches, and then travel over there. I have my satin stitch, then travel over there, which is my underlay, and I have my satin stitch there, and finishes right 
here. Shift X again so we can see our outlines. Now that's that's the way how I work my small, ever so small little text there. And that will guarantee if you work like that, it takes dedication, takes time, but applying all the rules and suggestions that we learned, it will definitely give you very good results. Just try it. At the beginning probably you will be having your troubles, but if you do it more often, then uh, you will get used to it. And it's really fun. It's really nice to see good results. So we still have a little time to show you another example, which is text on a circled, on a circle. All right. So let me let me call this this design here. Okay. Let's focus on on the logo here, and you see on the right hand side we have. Portland Country Club ORG.1895. This is placed in a circle. And like the sample before, I already found out that uh, the best matching font is the Helvetica True Type font. Before we attempt to, to work with the True Type font, let me create as a guideline a little circle. I, I will need to find out the center point of this logo. And the best way to do that is to create a circle. You see, I'm using my, my cursor, which has a crosshair, which is very helpful. If you don't have the crosshair, let me show you how you, how you switch that on. You go into in the menu tools, you go into configuration, user settings, and here in environment, let me see where it is. Yeah, right there, display, show crosshair cursor. All right. so. Make sure you have the, the button here activated, switched on, and then you will have where your cursor position is, that uh, the crosshair. All right, so let's start over. We'll place our crosshair right there where the limits are, and then you know I can, pr I can create an oval. A perfect circle is by pressing the shift key, maintaining the, the key pressed here, so you can really create a perfect circle right there. And you'll see most of the time when you we have a back or backdrop in image, depending on the quality, it's things are not always symmetric. So what, what you want to do is you want to create a logo that is symmetric, in this case a real circle. Now, with my artwork circle segment selected, you see here little squares and this is very nice because now I can drag down from my ruler bar, I can drag down a guideline. And you see, right there it is. And I'll do the same thing with the vertical guideline. So I take the little squares as a benchmark and there you are. So now I'm press F4. I'm sure that right here that's the center. Let's go to the circle text tool and what was the font again? Helvetica. Okay, circle circle text tool. Again, font type we change this to true type fonts. Oh, and by the way, I forgot to measure the the size of the letter, so let's try to find out by measuring here probably letter N. Control M on my keyboard. Measure this tiny little M, and you see it's very small. It's four millimeters, four point, four point ten millimeters. Very small indeed, four point ten. Okay. Now that we know that, true type, Helvetica, and it's the Helvetica normal. Again, since we're going to use the offset tool, I will go even smaller than 4.10. I will, let's try with 3.7. 3 3.7, and let me place, in this case it's all uppercase letters. Okay. 
it's all uppercase letters. So Portland, space, country, and club. All right. Now, from the with the circle text circle tool, you really need to make your first click in the center, and then you drag your circle to the outside. So let's try to find. And you see the the backdrop image is not really perfect. So I'm going to use like a middle line here. And you see here with version 14, I have. My, my scroll wheel is actually zooming in, so very helpful. So I can really go and measure this towards this area here. Let me go a little bit smaller like that. All right. We have the same situation like before. My circle text segment is in a complex field, which I will change. Fill a border to artwork, apply, OK. Now, let's move a little bit over there. Oh, it's a little bit too small. Let's increase this to 4.5. See the results. Yeah, I think that that will work. So again, as I did before, I'm going to move all my letters into the right position. So let's do it with, just with Portland and ignore the other text. Place it right there. We're good. Once you've done that, you can now convert your text, circle text segment into text segments. OK, so I press the equal key on the keyboard. As a result, I get individual letters. Let me press the four, number four key you see here. And again, I will now use my offset tool, so shift oh, no, before I do that I need to create a little circle which is one millimeter by one millimeter and change it to another color so I have a good view zoom in real big. Alright, letter P we have the same situation like the letter O on the straight X line it's basically two outlines, so we need to separate them by selecting the P, Control K, which is break apart. So now we have the outside. And let me check one thing here. I can see that you see the there are already a couple of nodes here. So what happens if I reduce the nodes? Yeah, the shape gets messed up. So let's undo that. Let's not do that. I will press Shift O, go straight into the offset tool and we don't need copy just say OK increase the size here you see nice coming close to what I need good what happened if I do reduce nodes here uh, yeah let's let's not do that control set then uh, well let's take care of the inside part you see here this inside part we will also have to select it, shift O, and work on this part as well. Again, we need to be careful. Let me not go too much. We can make it a little bit smaller than, than uh, one millimeter. You see, we are we're about 0 0.8 millimeter in the inside. There's a little little mess here with the nodes. Let's clean that up and uh, let's convert this one into a straight node and all the other ones here I will select them 
this bunch, right click and create smooth. Okay, so we have a little better result there. Good. Don't forget we're working here in a, in a huge zoom. We have a perfect letter P now. Now you, you want to do this with all the other letters and uh, once you have done that the next thing to do is to, to create the grid line. All right, let's let's do that. And I will base it on my letter P. I will use my ellipse. Start in the center and press the shift key. Sorry, the control control and shift it means starts from the center and creates a perfect circle. I'll place that one exactly where the P is. You see that? The, the bottom part of the P right there. Okay. And then we will do the same. We will do a copy of this circle. Let's change the color into green. Need to select it. Green. All right. Didn't change. Now it changed. And I'll make a copy. So control C, control V. I have another circle there and I'll I will uh, press W which is power edit in order to increase the size of that outer circle and place it right there on the top part of the P. Good. So we have our grid lines top and bottom. Now we need to to create that uh, distance which is 0 0.2 millimeters and I can do that with the offset tool shift O yeah here I need copy offset so let's you see here on the bottom left side of your screen it says offset 0 0.2 0 0.21 millimeters so I'm good and I'll do the same with the outer one I will press shift O copy yes and slide it in this case down 0 0.2 there we are now we have our grid line and we are ready to start digitizing let's zoom in letter P combine these two control L and use the slice tool remember the, the corners how to create the spiky corners so I will slice right here and I will slice right there. Alright. Next thing is Control K. Break this apart. You see here we have two artwork segments and uh, I will select first this one here. Let me get rid of these two points. Don't need them. And I will move this one, which should be a straight one, I will move this one a little bit up. Remember our slide before. And I will move this one a little bit down. And for this segment here, move this one a bit in, like that. And this one stays where it is. Good. So let's now convert this artwork segment into a satin stitch. Start by pressing D on the keyboard, on the selected artwork segment, place, place uh, an angle line here, place an angle line there, and maybe one here in the middle, and generate so we have our satin stitches. Then I select this one here and press D position my angle line there position an angle line here and then in between All right G for generate good so we're almost done and I see we are a bit over our time. 
So what we still need to do is, since this is the first letter of my text, I need to make sure that we have proper underlays here. So select this segment, and let me get off the 3D view, press insert on my keyboard, go to the run stitch tool, and let me think about it. So we will start here and this whole letter will be finishing here. So what we can do is we can start with the one, two, three, four little stitches and then we enter here and we place a single run underlay all the way down there press insert to switch off the insert command and you see here we have the run stitch segment followed by this satin stitch and then by this satin stitch. The last thing I need here is because letters are quite far apart let's press I for image you see here you you don't want to connect here it's way too too far away so we will have to use trims and when I use trims here I need to have a lock stitch so I can either use my automatic lock stitch let's use line and, and that's it let's have a look how the stitches are going right, somewhere here Okay, so it starts here with my lock stitches and you see this one is a little bit short that's why the stitches are not generating there Then we have my, our satin, our sharp corner and then going at the end. Alright, so what I meant with too short is what I mean here. Select the segment and let's zoom in so we really need to make sure that that the distances are acceptable in order for the stitches to generate properly yes all right so that concludes our webinar today. I hope that you are not too confused. I hope that you have learned a thing or two. You have seen a couple of tools that you have not used so far. Please try it. Thank you for participating and see you next time. Bye-bye.